So in our last video, we started talking about the process of a textual explication by considering the big picture, in particular the theme and the dramatic situation. You can think about the explication process as an upside-down triangle. You start with the big stuff and work your way down to the increasingly smaller details. In this video, we will focus on the middle of that triangle. This section is where the kind of literature you are explicating, the genre of the text, is the most prominent. You can think about this section in terms of the form and structure. In some ways, when explicating poetry, we are literally thinking about what the poem looks like on the page. In outline form, this section of an explication might look something like this. Poetic form, if any, and organization. Stanzas, rhyme scheme, meter. We can talk a bit here about form, but as with that question of theme in the last video, we will leave most of that discussion for class. By form, I mean what kind of poem is it? There are a great many different kinds of poems, each with its own set of rules and requirements. Some of the forms you may be familiar with are the sonnet, as we saw in the last video, the haiku, and the limerick. There's nothing particularly special about these forms. They're just a bit more well-known than some of the others. The way you can identify the form of a poem is by figuring out the other things listed in the previous section. For example, an English sonnet always has three stanzas of four lines each, also known as quatrains, and a stanza with only two lines, also known as a couplet. Sonnets also follow a specific rhyme scheme and are written with a certain meter. So, figuring out those details helps you figure out the form. That's form in a nutshell, and as I said, we'll come back to it later. You can also think about what kind of poem it is by what it's trying to do. These forms don't necessarily come with specific requirements like we discussed. Some poems, for example, are epics, in that they are very long and tell grand tales. If you've read the Iliad or the Odyssey, you know all about epic poetry. Or they can be lyrical, as we discussed in the previous video, a poem that is simply a rumination on some idea or concept. Or a poem can be an elegy, written to lament the death of a close friend or an important person. Even more generally, we can ask how the poem has how the poet has organized the poem. Is it logical, making an argument? Is it narrative, telling a story? Or is it repetitive, cycling through the same lines or stanzas again and again? We already said that in the last video, that our two examples were lyrical poems. They didn't tell stories, they explored ideas. Take a look at each again. Would you say they are logical, narrative, or repetitive in their organization? Right, they are each making an argument. So, we would describe their structure as both lyrical and logical. Stanzas are the poetic equivalent of paragraphs. Often, a poet will provide an extra line break between stanzas to make our job as explicators that much easier, but not always. Here we are going to start getting into some of the unique jargon of poetry. Stanzas are named according to how many lines are in the stanza. It's a pretty straightforward system. The list actually goes on, but for our purposes, this should suffice. So, for example, if we were to look at Edgar Allan Poe's famous poem, The Raven, just by glancing at it and counting the lines, we could say that the poem was written in sestets, since each stanza has six lines in it. But it's not always that easy. Take another look at McKay's poem, If We Must Die. How would you describe the stanzic structure of that poem? Just because the poet doesn't provide extra space between the stanzas doesn't mean there aren't multiple stanzas. The other way a poet can create stanzic structure of a poem is through the rhyme scheme. By rhyme scheme, we mean what is the pattern created by the final sound of each line? What sound does that last word or syllable of each line in McKay's poem make? To make the pattern easier to see when analyzing a poem, we mark each different sound with a new letter. When we're done, we can clearly see the pattern. Hogs, spot. Dogs, lot. Die, shed. Defy, dead. Foe, brave. Blow, grave. Pack, back. So now, despite the lack of line breaks, we can see the stanzic structure of McKay's poem. How would we describe it? Right, we would say it has three quatrains, 
and one couplet. If that sounds familiar, it should. It's one of the requirements for a sonnet I mentioned earlier. So you can see how these clues often feed off one another. Sometimes if you can't figure out one aspect, you need to look at something else first. We have one more thing to consider with the form focus section of explication. That's the meter of the poem. This can be one of the most frustrating for people unfamiliar with it, so just take it slowly. We'll continue to work on all this in class. When we talk about the meter of a poem, we are talking about the pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables in each line of the poem. Many poems use the same meter for every line. In English, we stress some syllables and not others. Think about it. Here in New Orleans, we do some interesting things with street names. How do you pronounce this word when trying to name the certain shade of purple? Right, burgundy. We stress that first syllable. We're not really saying it more loudly, rather we're emphasizing it more. Okay, but here in New Orleans, there's a street in the French Quarter with that same name. How do we pronounce that? Right, we say Burgundy. We stress that second syllable, and as a result, we change the way the word sounds. When we look at the meter of a poem, we are looking for where the stressed syllables are, because the poet will often write the line to follow a certain pattern. As with stanzas, we have some specialized language to describe all this more precisely. With meter, we talk about feet. A metric foot is a set of two or three syllables that follow a certain pattern. For example, a foot with an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable is called an iam. And a foot that starts with a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable is called trochaic. If a line of poetry is written using a specific meter, it will have a series of feet following the same pattern. You just have to count up the number of feet to identify the line. For these, we use more specialized language. A line with only two feet is a diameter. A line with four feet is tetrameter. A line with five feet is pentameter. We will spend a good amount of time in class on meter in particular. For now, though, let's take a look at McKay's poem once again and try to see a metric pattern. Here's the first line. Now these are one-syllable words, but even so, we still place more emphasis on some words than on others. Try speaking this line aloud with some conviction and see if you can hear a pattern. One thing to bear in mind is that the better the poet is, the more subtle the meter will be. If you're stuck, count the number of total syllables in the line. Most people will agree that this is the pattern McKay intended. If so, what will we call this pattern? What do we see in the line? Unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed. What's the recurring pattern? Right, unstressed, stressed. What's that called? Iambic. How many of those iambic feet are in each line? Five. What's that called? Pentameter. So you put those two pieces of information together and you get iambic pentameter. Again, it's a very jargony, but it's also a very precise way of describing the meter of a poem. Ultimately, we can say this about McKay's poem. It has three quatrains and one couplet, follows the rhyme scheme of ABAB, CDCD, EFEF, GG and it's written in iambic pentameter. Those three details tell us that McKay's poem is a sonnet, just like Shakespeare's Sonnet 116. Okay, that's a lot of information very quickly. In class, I'll give you a handout that outlines all this and includes all the fancy terminology. Remember, we're just getting started with all this, so don't feel overwhelmed. Now that you've watched these first two videos, be sure to complete the very short video quiz one on the videos page in Blackboard before our next class. Thanks for watching.